welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. In this week's episode, the ultimate Revit custom material marathon. Learn how to find, create, and manage your own custom material libraries in Autodesk Revit. If you can tell a rendering was created in Revit simply because you recognize the brick material, this class is definitely for you. Presented this webinar is Jeffrey Pinero, the creator of the RevitKit.com, where he publishes videos, tips, tutorials, and info on all things Revit and or BIM related. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is one of the largest online design software stores. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our webpage at noveg.com. For more rewards and special, you should always check the Noveg blog. Keep up with the latest software updates and enjoy inspiring interviews, like the one we did with today's webinar presenter, Jeffrey Pinero himself. You can also get daily software news following us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Coming up next week, early design in a BIM workflow with Vectorworks. Vectorworks Designer 2014 can be used to initiate the design of a project by creating massive models for form studies. Find out how to use direct modeling tools and develop your schematic processes into intelligent information models that can also be used for documentation. Last but not least, today's presentation is free and is being recorded live. If you want to rewatch this webinar or any webinar episode, you can find it on our YouTube and Vimeo channel. Just search for Novage. And now, uh, I'm ready to pass the baton to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I'm going to make you the presenter and uh, drum roll. And um, the stage is all yours. Thanks, Barbara. Can you see my screen? Absolutely. Great. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction, Barbara. I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, I wanted to do something fun today, uh, something a little different, and I've been doing a lot of renderings lately, so I, I thought uh, showing some of my techniques on creating and using custom materials would be beneficial. And it looks like uh, it hasn't been touched on in the Novage series, so I thought I'd add it to the series. So first, I want to open up a little agenda I created here, just so you know where we're going. Um, I'm going to show you how to find custom material maps, where I go to find material textures and, and, um, and seamless, seamless maps. Um, also how to create them, um, as far as creating bump maps and, and matching them up and then applying them. Uh, setting up Revit to use custom materials, uh, basically pointing to the correct folder so when you go to render you don't have missing files. Um, creating custom materials. Uh, there's three, three examples I'm going to show. I might show four if we have enough time. But um, it's going to be a polished concrete floor, a CMU wall using custom material and realistic glazing. And then I'm just going to show you how to manage custom materials once you're set. And that's really um, taking a material and creating your own library and being able to use it in multiple projects. First, what I wanted to do is just show a couple examples of what custom materials can do for you as far as Revit are concerned. And actually, some of the materials I'm going to show you are being used in these renderings. So I'm just going to open this rendering. And what you can see here, this is a fully, fully Revit rendering with a little bit of Photoshop afterwards. Um, the CMU wall in the back here, that's a custom material. Uh, the CMU wall here is custom material. You can see the metal panels are all custom materials. So all of this was created the, using the methods that I'm going to show you today. If I move along, here's another view. Uh, there's a CMU wall in the background that's custom. There's a carpet that's custom. Basically, everything in this rendering is actually pretty custom, I mean, even the plywood as well. So you can see how, how different and dynamic your renderings become. Here's another example. Now, this is a pretty cool one. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple little techniques going on in here. Um, one of them is a, a glowing material, which you can see on those yellow, those yellow fins. Uh, there's also some glazing stuff happening, which you can see the glow going on the bottom. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that later on. And here's actually going to bring us to the first material I'm going to show you how to create. Um, so in this, in this view, you can see we have a CMU wall on the right-hand side here. We have a uh, custom wood material. We also have a custom floor, which uh, is, is a polished concrete type of floor. And then again, the plywood. So you can see, let me see if there's one more. Nope, that was it. 
So you can see what custom materials can do to your renderings. And if you've been using Revit for a while without doing this, you'll realize that you very quickly run out of materials to use when it comes to rendering and applying materials. So I'm going to show you my process of, of, of setting this up. What I have here is a quick um, example file. If I go to 3D, you can see what it is. It's just a box with a window. And this is what we're going to use to apply materials to. The first one I'm going to show you is the polished concrete. Actually, before we move on, let me go back to my agenda so I don't forget it. Uh, we actually need to set up Revit. So when you're creating custom materials, there's, there's options of where you want to save your JPEG files that you download and create. Um, I suggest creating your own materials folder. Some people will use the Revit or the Autodesk default one, and this way you don't have to do any of this. But keeping your custom material folders means that you can, you can throw them on a USB or a cloud drive and always have uh, your different machines pointing at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to point it to my webinar folder for today. So I'm actually using Revit 2015. If you hit the Revit button, you go to Options, you go to Rendering, and then you hit the little plus sign, which is Add Value. Then when you click in inside that value that was just created, all the way to the right is your little Browse button, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, and it's usually hidden and you never see it, but I'm pointing it out now. So if you hit this, it's going to ask you to browse. And what you're doing here is you're telling Revit to not only look in the default Autodesk folder, but to look in these selected folders for your custom materials. So I'm actually just going to use my material webinar folder for my desktop. I typically have a cloud drive that has my materials on it. And actually at the end of this webinar, I'm going to point you guys to a website where you can sign up and download my entire texture library completely free. Um, so that'll be later. So what I did was I pointed to my material webinar. Now that's where I'm going to download my custom materials. So let me just click OK. And I'm sure you guys have seen, if, if you've even tried to make custom materials, that warning that says uh, um, brick, brick masonry material JPEG is missing. That's because you're not pointing to the folder or it's just not there. So now as far as downloading materials and where, where I actually get my materials, I always start with cgtextures.com. So I'm going to pull this up. You can see it's called cgtextures.com. I usually start here because they have good textures. Um, you can use a free account and get some decent resolution if you want. It's actually pretty, pretty affordable to get the, um, <clears throat> the professional account, which allows you to download much higher resolution. But it has pretty much everything you can look for in um, a lot of very good seamless textures, which is very difficult to find. Uh, the other location I would go is a site called gobotree.com. This is more for cutouts later on, but they do have some materials. And the final site that I would look at is actually Google. So if I go to Google and search images, sometimes you can search seamless, let's try it, seamless concrete texture. You can see you've actually got some that work, and some might even pull from, from other ones. So certain materials uh, you'll, you'll be able to find on Google, certain materials you won't, and they're usually not seamless. So it looks like concrete was a bad example because they've got a, a bunch here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use go, uh, CG textures, and I'm going to look for a concrete. I'm going to make the col uh, polished concrete floor. So if I click concrete, I go to bare, and we're going to find one. Let's uh, let's do a set tile. Let's do this sort of rusty, rusty looking one. So you can see I'm actually not logged in right now to my pro account, so this is this is actually completely free. And you'll see that they limit. You know, premium members get different sizes, but they limit you on this one to uh, 700 by 700. Another nice thing about CG textures is, it, is if you click 3D tiling preview, I'll click it now, you can get a sense of what it looks like uh, tiled, and you can see the seams. This is actually not the greatest example because you get sort of rhythm going, but we're going to use it anyways. So without, without logging into my premium, I'm just going to log into my free account, and I can actually download this file. So now I'm downloading the file. So if I take that and I put it in that folder, the material webinar folder, and press paste, you can see I've got my texture in this folder. Now, we're going to apply this. So we already set the folder, so we don't need to do that. And once you set it, Revit remembers all the locations, so you'll be good. So I'm going to do, I'm going to apply it to this floor. So I'm just going to tab or drag across because it won't let me tag. And I'm going to hit the floor. Now one of the things that's really nice about Revit 
and it's maybe not so nice in other programs, although of course material editors in 3D Max and whatnot have, has, have advantages as well over Revit. But one of the nice things is that Revit has a lot of predefined assets that you can start with and then just change textures and, and manipulate things. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select this floor, select this material. And you can see I already had one called Concrete Floor, but I'm going to do that again because this wasn't supposed to have it in there. I'll say Create New Material. I'm going to rename it. I'm going to call it Polished Concrete Floor. Now, if I go over to Appearance, you can see there's nothing applied. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use an existing asset. And that's the great thing about Revit is that you can use these existing assets such as wood floors and CMU walls and concrete walls and um, even different types of glass. And then you can just tweak them later on. And one thing I found with polished concrete floor is if you use the polished wood floor to, to start, it actually creates a really nice effect um, for the polished concrete floor. So I'm going to do that here. So I'm going to do I'm going to replace the asset. I'm going to search for wood. And then I'm going to click flooring. And I'm just going to pick one of these one of these wood floors. I'll do toasted brown. Beach wood toasted brown. Now you may be thinking, well, it's a wood floor, you know, why, why should I use it for concrete? It really has a lot to do with the relief pattern and the semi-gloss varnish and how it's sort of set up originally. Um, <clears throat> although you're using, you're going to use a concrete texture, the based on wood grain relief pattern and the semi-gloss make a really, really nice effect as far as um, polished concrete floor is concerned. So now what I want to do is before I start changing things, because right now, if you notice, I pull down the information, this is actually called Beechwood Toasted Brown. It's all this information in here. I don't want to duplicate that. I, I mean, I don't want to overwrite that. I want to duplicate it and create my own. Uh, this is sort of an assets versus materials thing, which um, I won't get into because we only have 40 minutes here. But really just duplicate your, your materials when you choose a new asset. Otherwise, you're going to change it later on when you want a Beechwood uh, Toasted Brown floor and all of a sudden it uh, looks like concrete. So I'm going to duplicate it. You can see a little one went next to it. And I'm going to call it Polished Concrete Webinar so it doesn't mess with another one. I'm just going to get rid of the description for now. Okay, so now we've got a new material and we've got a new asset. Now all I want to do is attach that JPEG to the material. So I'm going to go to my desktop folder that I just created. And I'll go to Large Icon so you can see it. I'm going to select my map. You can see right away in the in the image here, it already changed. Let me pull this up. If you want, if you click the image, you can change the scale of it a little bit. I think it's probably okay the way it is. I'm sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. I live in an apartment full of dogs. Okay, so three foot three by three foot three. We're gonna leave that as is. And click done. Now I'm gonna click OK and OK and click OK again. And if I go to Realistic, you'll see on the floor, I've got my concrete floor. Now I'm going to show you a fully rendered version of this later. Um, it actually had a little issue in the, in the cloud uh, rendering and I accidentally deleted it, so it should be done by the end of this webinar and I'll show you. So that's how you create a quick polished concrete floor. And if you want to get an idea of what it looks like at the end, I'll pull up that example again. And you can see down there it's polished concrete. This, is, this was rendered in the cloud, so for some reason it, it gives this little bit of a stipple to it. Um, if you rendered it natively, you would see a completely smooth, nice looking uh, concrete floor. So now what I want to do is I want to create the walls using a custom CMU texture. And the reason I chose to, use, to, to do it in this order is that the, the concrete floor only requires the map, whereas a CMU wall is going to require the map and a bump map. So I'm going to show you how to create a bump map after downloading the texture. So I'm going to go back to cgtextures.com and I'm going to close this tab. Now I'm going to look for my CMU. So uh, CG Texture has it under brick for some reason, but I just knew that ahead of time. Um, you can see there's all these different options. So I'm going to go to blocks. And I'm going to look around for something we can use. I'll just use uh, set tiled huge. Let's, let's use this one here. It's got a little bit of a difference. So that's kind of interesting. Not the most attractive wall, but it looks alright. So I'm going to download this one. It's probably going to my downloads folder, so let me just cut it real quick into the desktop folder. So now I have it in my desktop folder. Now what I want to do is I want to make, make a bump map before I go into this. 
So <clears throat> if you're not using Photoshop and you're doing renderings, um, I suggest you, you use it. There's major, major benefits, especially in post-processing, which I won't get into in this webinar, but you can search the blog or even in my BIM After Dark videos, you can see that, that post-processing has a lot to do with uh, the final renderings that you see uh, when you look around the Internet. So I'm just going to open that texture in Photoshop. So let's go to Material Webinar, Break Large Block. So there it is there. Now I'm going to save as. Also, if you notice, I'm not renaming them. I highly suggest you rename these materials to something you know for later on. Uh, you'll see when you download my texture library that I didn't rename a lot of them just because of time, and it, it, it makes it a little difficult later. You have to sort of look at them all in preview. Um, so I'm going to do underscore bump. So now I've saved this as a bump map. So now what I need to do is make it a bump map. So in Photoshop, you simply go to Image, Adjustments, and Black and White. What that's going to do is it's just going to remove all the all the um, color from it, which is good. You want a black and white. Now the way bump maps work is uh, whatever is black is going to recess, and whatever is white is going to pop out. So it's pretty easy, you know, black void. Think about it that way. So this was actually a good example to use because the the um, the joints between the, the the blocks are actually pretty dark already. But we want to make sure that we don't have these uh, darker darker colored bricks in the middle here or blocks uh, recess too much. So we're going to change the levels. So in Photoshop you just click Control L, which is levels. I think it's under image adjustments levels, but I use Control L. And now you see if I take the slider, you can see what's happening here. So we're able to control the grays, which is nice. What we want to do is we want to remove a lot of the grays and only keep those lines in the middle, right? So if I pull this right slider to the left and then I pull the middle slider to the right, you can see I can start extracting. Sorry, guys. I'm getting emails about the webinar. I should close that. Okay. You can see I can start extracting the joints themselves, which is what we want to do, because we want we want these darker black lines to recess, and we want the the normal gray lines to to pop out. So I'm not going to get too too perfect with it, but you can see what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to remove some of those grays and enhance the the joints. So there we go. We've got a bump map. Now let me just save as again, make sure I'm not overriding the other one. It doesn't look like I am. Save OK. OK. So now I'll go back to hidden lines so you don't see any crazy stuff. So now I'm going to apply it to these walls. So if I click the wall, I go to edit type, then I change the material. I mean, you could go through management material and do it all that way, but I'm just going to do it this way. So now I'm going to create a new material. I'm going to rename it and I'm going to call it CMU wall webinar. Now I'm going to go back to the appearance and you'll see I have nothing applied. So again, like I mentioned before, the great thing about Revit is that there's a lot of custom materials. I mean, a, a lot of uh, basic assets that you can use to start, which is great. So what I want to do is I want to use a CMU asset. I might as well. If, if you have something that's really close, if you're using bricks, if you're using wood, you might as well start with that and see where it goes. So I'm going to replace I'm going to type concrete, masonry, and you'll see this uh, under masonry, there's some stuff going on. If you go to uh, default, there might be, no, it's just concrete. <clears throat> so I'll go back to here, and I'll use uh, masonry, concrete, masonry units, and I'm going to replace it. So now, again, I don't want to change this asset. What I want to do is I want to make my own. So I need to make sure I duplicate it. So I duplicated it. Um, the The... The new material editor is nice in that you have these assets, and you'll see later on when I show you how to manage them, it's great. But you just got to remember to duplicate, otherwise you're going to run into some serious issues later. So we're going to call this CMU webinar just so it has a new name. And now you'll notice, because I chose CMU already, I've got a masonry tab, which is interesting, but it's really just the bump map, I mean the, the map. And then I've got a relief pattern, which is going to be our bump map. So I'm just going to change these. So I click on the... On the image, oh, actually, I could have I could have clicked here too. You could click either one. I'm clicking on the text or clicking on the image, and then click the text. And now I'm going to go search and find that CMU. Let me see here, material webinar. So it's brick large. Okay. <clears throat> and as far as scale for CMU, you have something to sort of scale it off of. So what I usually do is I'll count, if I know the size of it, I'll count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 or 13, and then I'll just simply do, do the math. 
you know, 12 times, let's say it's an 8 inch block, that's 96 inches. So I'll use that as a guide, 96 inches. Usually they're squares, so I'll just go with 96 by 96, but you could also count lengthwise and say, uh, you know, how big are my blocks, and you could, you could scale. Now what I need to do is I need to add a relief pattern that matches up with it, which is what we already created. So if I simply click the, the um, material down here, which is uh, cmurunning.bump, <clears throat> and I go to my material webinar folder, you can see I have my, my bump map, which we created using Photoshop. Now what I need to make sure I do is I line up the bump map with the regular map. So again, we did 8 feet, so I'll just do 8 feet by 8 feet. Click OK. And now just to show you, as long as my computer doesn't explode, what these bump maps do, I'll use it right in the render preview. So hopefully you can see the render preview. And now we've got a bump map and we've got a brick large block, right? If I crank up the bump map, if you watch the render preview, notice how all these recesses and it gets real choppy. If I go even further and even further, you can see it starts, it starts revealing all those, all those uh, the black lines we created, they, they, they sink in. So we don't want to go too much, but that's what bump maps do. And you can see how that, that adds a lot of realism to your, to your images. So we'll do something like 0.49, click OK. Click OK. Now if I go to realistic, that's a little dark, huh? That's, uh, if I zoom in a little bit, maybe you can see. So it's a little dark as I didn't render it yet, but you can see we've got the brick there. So that's how you create pretty much anything in Revit, but beyond getting even more custom, is, is you want to you create um, a map and then you want to create a bump map out of it, which is great. So let's check out our agenda to make sure we're doing all right here. So we talked about finding custom material maps, CG textures, and uh, Google, as well as um, Gobo Tree might be one. But between CG textures and Google, you'll probably be re re really spot on there. Uh, setting up Revit, again, we, we pointed to the, the location we wanted, and we can point to multiple locations and multiple, on multiple computers, and now we're creating custom materials. So we've created the polished concrete floor, which is simply a map, and then adding a, a, a semi-gloss varnish to it using the, the floor, the wood floor. And um, we also talked about custom CME walls, which is big. I mean, if, you, if, I, if, if I look at this, these examples again, I'll show you. I'll show you where the bump map. So you can see the CMU wall here and the CMU wall there. And if I go inside, same thing with these CMU walls as well as the plywood. And if, even if I continue, the plywood wall here or the, uh, the custom wall here, the plywood, all of these are just simply a, a map and a bump map, which is great. So now one thing I want to point out, which is the next sort of uh, tweak I'm going to show you, is if I zoom in, you can see the glass is not necessarily a plate glass wall. Now, if you use the default Revit glazing material, um, it's just a straight plate glass wall. There's really not, no variation to it, and it can almost get lost, especially if you don't have any seams to it. And so what I started doing was I started thinking of different ways to tweak the glass and make it a little more realistic. Um, so what I call it, I call it the uh, glazing bump technique, or I mean, you could call it whatever you want. I think I... There's, there might be a little bit of a write-up on the blog as well on this, but I'll show you right, right now. Uh, if I zoom in here as well, if you notice the reflection on the glass, notice how it looks like there's a little bit of convex or con concavity to it? That's because of this technique, and I think it adds a lot of realism to your renderings, and it, it sort of you know, varies the glass and, and, and makes it so that you notice it's glass. Let's see if there's any other examples. Even on here, actually, if I zoom in, you can see there's a little variation in the glazing. It's got this nice little little bump and waviness to it, and that's really what glass looks like in real life, whether it's building pressure pushing it out or, or it's just not a straight piece of glass. So this is a pretty cool technique. Um, it took me a little while to figure out how to get this to work nicely in Revit, but um, <clears throat> it's actually very simple. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use... Oops, let me go back into here. So if I zoom in... And I tab around, oops, I can't tab, there we go. I'm going to select this curtain panel glazed, only because that's how I'm getting to the glass material. You don't have to do it that way. You can do it whatever way you want if you know what material it is. Now, if you remember, I said that Revit has a lot of built-in assets, which are extremely powerful. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I actually just peered over at the questions, and I don't want to, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to get distracted. I apologize. 
So <clears throat> again, Revit has a bunch of assets which are very powerful. So I'm thinking, how can I create uh, a glazing material? What, what asset would be close to it where I can start making this bump into the glass without using the glazing? Because if you notice, the typical glazing does not have the ability to add a bump map to it. So there's two, there's two ways you go about it. One is to create a generic material, which is off the start. If I click Create and I go to Appearance, you see you've got all these options for reflectivity, transparency, cutout, self-illumination, bump, all this stuff, right? So I thought, oh, I can go through all this and try and tweak it, but it might take me a long time to figure that out. So what I did was I looked through what kind of what other glass materials Revit has. So I'm going to go to my glass. I'm going to go Replace, <coughs> and I type in Glass. Okay, so if I click under glass and I scroll down, you'll see there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's different colors. There, it's clear. It's not. If I go to glass and glazing and I scroll down, there's a couple other things. Um, masonry. You can see this glass block. So I'm thinking, okay, glass block, it's got a bump to it, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, I would assume it would. So I, I took a look at the type of glass blocks that are there. Oops, glass block. So you have glass block and, and glass block square stack. So if you look at the glass block, I'm actually going to use that one. I'm going to pull it in. If I pull this down, look at, their, look at what we have there, if it refreshes, you're going to see there's glass block. <clears throat> and not only does it have a bump, but it's also got a transparency override. It's got all kinds of things happening. So I thought, this is great. You know, look at, look at the di you know, how dynamic it looks. It's really cool. So I thought I would use this as my starting asset. So I'm going to duplicate this, and I'm going to call it glass with bump. I guess you could change it here. You could say glass, blah, 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 blah. You give a description. It doesn't really matter. Now, the one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to have this greenish color. That's my preference. If you want green, you can go for it. So I'll just change it a little bit. And if, you're, if you know 3D Max or V-Ray or anything, this is essentially the FOD color it ends up being. So if I click that, you'll see it changes from a, a green hue <clears throat> to more uh, bluish-purple hue. Reflectivity we're going to leave alone right now. Uh, transparency, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the transparency. Because right now what they have is they have an image which is not allowing you to see through those pieces where the grout is. And I'm just going to say remove image. You can see it got solid. So now in tweaking, I realize that I need to adjust this a little bit. So I'll give it a transparency. I'll go up to 70 for now. Let's see. If you keep looking at the preview, you can see how it's updating a little bit. We'll go a little higher. Let's go to 80. Okay, so we've got a little piece of glass there. Now look at this. We have a bump. How great. So now it's what do we use? If I if I open this, you can see what they're using. This is the glass block bump. So there's all those little ridges and all this other good stuff. So I'm like, okay, what do I use here? So what I did was I actually created a created my own bump that will allow me to make this convex, concave look. So if I go to my explorer, I actually forgot to bring this into the folder, so let me just make sure I can bring it in there. Materials. This is actually what you're seeing here <clears throat> is the material library that you will get if you after at the end of this webinar. So I'm going to bring in this guy to my webinar folder. Okay. So this is what I made in Photoshop. Pretty simple. Jeffrey, we lost your sound. So let's apply that to my glass. I'll go to my material webinar, glass bump square. Now the key here is to scale it the size of your panels. Obviously that can be a little difficult depending on the curtain wall system. I did a simple one here where they're all the same and I know that they're at three feet by three feet. If you have one that's three by seven, you can do that and you can start seeing where it lays out. So I'm going to do three by three, click apply, and click OK, and click OK. So now, if I pull out my examples, actually I'll show you exactly what this looks like. Let me pull out an example here. Again, I, the rendering 
the rendering did not finish. That was a, an issue there. So let me just pull out the example for you. you can see we have the custom blares. So you guys can see I'm actually going onto the blog real quick because I can't believe I forgot to download this. I apologize. Realistic class. Uh, realistic equation. Oh, I must not down. So it was really just going to be examples similar to this. So I'll just pull up the example one more time. <clears throat> So if I go through, here's a perfect example. So now you can see the glass sort of has this waviness in it. It has this bump. It has this removing. <clears throat> and it, it adds that, you know, a little, a little dynamic effect to your glazing. So I think it will bump up your renderings quite a bit. So it looks like we have 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the final piece of our agenda. Wow, the time went by a lot faster than I thought it was going to. So managing custom materials. <clears throat> Excuse me while I take some water. Okay, so once you have a whole bunch of these custom materials, <clears throat> how do you bring them into, from project to project? So I've got this one project here, <clears throat> and I've created my CMU, I've created my class, and now I want to bring them into another project. Well, the way I used to do it is I used to just copy and paste the, I had to make sure the materials are a different name and copy and paste them in. But you don't have to do that anymore. What you do is you create what's called a library. <clears throat> so I'm going to go under Manage Materials. And then I'm going to hit my asset browser, which is what we were pulling from before. So you can see where my mouse is. There's a little button. You can actually turn it on and off. <clears throat> and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new library. And I'm going to call this one Webinar Library. Click OK. So what it did is it made a folder within our asset browser. <clears throat> and it also saves this library file somewhere where you can bring it to different machines. But now what I can do is I can actually start dragging these materials. I apologize, not the material, you've got to drag the asset. I can start dragging these assets into this webinar library. Um, one thing that Autodesk did not do a good job at is if you want to bring more than one asset, it's a little tedious. And what I mean by that is if, you, if, if the asset's not in this folder and you want to find it, so let's say I want to look for my glass with bump. So I'll type glass with bump. <clears throat> you can see here it is there. But because it's not in the library, if I go, my, my folder disappears. So what you have to do is you have to sort of manually look for them. And if you go to Document Assets, this is going to show you every asset that's, that's in the document or in this file. So you filter it, and I'm going to scroll down to where it says Glass. So there it is there, Glass with Bump. So I wish there was a way to sort of leave these folders when you're filtering, because then you can filter, grab, and pull over. But there's not, unfortunately. <clears throat> But if you want to grab multiples or an entire library, it's pretty easy. So I can just drag this now, and you can see it's allowing me to add it to my webinar library. So I'm going to add it there. I'm also going to add my CMU. Again, I just went to filter. I apologize. I don't want to go to filter. I'm going to go down to where it says CMU. So CMU webinar. <clears throat> now I'm just going to add this into my folder. The last one is going to be the polished concrete floor. So if I go down to P, polished concrete floor, just drag it over. Now if I click here, you see I got my three assets, which is great. You know, that's cool we have them here. But the great, great, great part of it is if you create a new project, we'll just do an architectural template, and I go to my materials, manage materials, <coughs> and I want to Let's say I want to change this glass to that asset. If I go to Appearance, Replace, notice I have my library here, my asset browser. If I click it, I've got my glass with bumps, and I hit it in there, and now I've got the material. So you can sit there and build your library, and it'll make your life much, much easier down the road. Also, if you wanted to open the library on a new, new machine, simply click on the bottom left-hand corner and say Open Existing Library, and it's going to look for these files. Let me close this. 
Now, it's uh, it's been 34 minutes, so not quite 40, but I see a whole bunch of questions. So, Barbara, do you think we should just start doing questions? Yes, sure. Go ahead. I know a lot of people are really waiting for your answer, so that's what it seems. Wanna, yeah, that's you okay. can choose and. That's all right. Um, before, you can choose and... Yep, let me... Um, before I move on to questions, I guess, I'll just uh, <clears throat> open up a little thing here. So if you guys want to download my entire texture library, so it's the one that I sort of use, it's just not organized very well, just go to www.thenovegkids, or novegkids, depending on how you want to say it, .com, and there's a little sign-up link, and you can download the, the, um, the library. So let's see. I'll just look through the questions. Here. There's a whole bunch of them here. We'll go back to if you had only one or two. Which is good high quality. So the first question is from Angelo, and it says, if you had only one or two sites to purchase good high quality textures from, <clears throat> what would it be? I would say cgtextures.com. Um, it's it's fairly reasonably priced when you for free you get uh, 15 megabytes per day, which is very it's actually pretty generous. But you only you're limited to your 640 by 640. <clears throat> but you can see the premium member gets 1600 by 1600. So if I go to premium members, it might might show us how much it was. I forgot. I haven't done it in a while. Uh, it's pretty reasonable, though. So here we go. Normal. Uh, so it's 59 euros uh, or pounds. I can't even read that from here. Uh, per year. So that's pretty good, and that's unlimited texture downloads. I would highly suggest CG Textures. Uh, as far as number two, I, I don't really use anyone else, so I hope that helps. Um, I do have a premium membership because getting those higher higher end stuff r really helps out. Um, let's see here. The CG textures have a California ledgestone pattern. Um, <clears throat> John asked if CG textures has a Car uh, Carolina ledgestone pattern. I have no idea. Um, you can just go on and search. Sometimes uh, the th you got to sort of know what you're looking for or just dig around a little bit for what you find, what you can find. But you can see I'm just clicking around you get a ton of stuff. So. Um, We'll go on to the next one. Is there a benefit? Is there a benefit to uh, assigning materials in the in the family over painting the material? Gary Gary asks. So that's a good one, actually. Is there a benefit to assigning materials over painting the material? I'd say yes. Uh, I highly, I as much as possible, I try not to paint anything. Um, it just gets ugly in the end, and and removing paints a pain in the butt. Um, actually, at our at Revit Technology Conference this year, I believe uh, Scott Brown, I think, did a an interior design uh, lecture, and it was called "Friends Don't Let Friends uh, Paint." So, <laughs> uh, I, I highly suggest not doing it. It's mainly because when you, when you paint something, and I'll pull it up real quick. So let's go to 3D. Let's hide. Let's hide this here. Hide it. <clears throat> so if I if I go to realistic here. Realistic, and I want to paint this face of the wall a color. So let's go to modify. Let's paint it, <clears throat> and uh, let's let's use gypsum wallboard. So we're going to paint the inside of this gypsum wallboard. You can see that. So my biggest issue is when someone else is using it, or even you go back to use it, and you want to change this wall. The process of removing paint is hitting this little button, going to remove paint, and clicking remove paint. And if you don't know what's painted, well then you, it's going to take you forever to figure that out. And if you have multiple things painted and a whole bunch of stuff, it's a lot harder to do. You're almost using a type instead. And, and I think it just honestly gets out of control. Um, Angelo has a couple more questions here. Will these custom materials translate to 3D Max without any tweaking? <clears throat> uh, yes, they can. If you're using Mental Ray and you have 3D Max and Revit both pointing to the correct areas, it will, it will translate. Uh, whether it needs to be tweaked, I can't tell you that because uh, even, even regular Revit materials seem to have a, uh, a hard time going between the two. But um, as long as you point those things to the right material library, there sh you should at least see them. Um, one more, having a custom material folder seems a, a better idea as each new version of Revit is a new folder. Yes. Okay, that's not really a question. Sorry, Angela. So Caitlin asks, is there an average or standard minimum size <coughs> for JPEG images that you download to use for good quality. Okay, so that's a pretty good one. Um, yes and no. Uh, 
I'd say for depending on on the rendering, and there's a lot of information uh, in not just Revit, but if you look at you know CG CG Architect and stuff like that, I'd say it depends on how close you are to to the image. So like for instance, on this image, you're far away; it's dark. It doesn't make a big difference. Whereas on this image or on the other interior image, you're much much closer, and that's where you want the higher resolution because it will reflect a much higher resolution image uh, in your rendering. So I would say, depending on what you're using, the higher the better. Um, but there's also a limit that's too high. You know, if, if you have something that's 60,000 by 60,000 pixels, I don't suggest using it. Um, Marie asked, "Is Jeff saying bump map? What does that stand for or mean?" Um, that was at 220. You must. Well, a bump map, like I said before, uh, Marie. Uh, Marie, maybe you missed it. Uh, I was showing you how to create a bump map. What it is is it's the negative image, which you might have seen before. Let me pull up the Navage webinar. And what it is is, is it, short, it gives three, three dimensions to a flat surface. <clears throat> so in here, this is the bump map that we created. So if you, if you go back when this is live, go back and watch this, this part of it if you didn't see it. And whatever's black recesses, whatever is white, bumps forward. And that's why it's called the bump map. Um, let's see here. Uh, Matthew asked, do you have a technique for creating randomized metal panel in Revit? Matt, I do. I don't. I, I, maybe we'll have to take this outside of the webinar. I don't think it's fully relevant with it, but there is, there is multiple ways. And um, you can see in this, in this image here, actually, if I pull it up, if you remember these images, um, those are metal panels slash curtain wall systems that I've used. Um, you can see there's a little random part of it, too. And so uh, maybe that's something I can... Uh, maybe email me and we can create a blog post or something together. Um, Angelo asked again. Let's see, what did Angelo ask? <clears throat> Any general guidelines or things to look out for when rendering in the cloud? What works? What to stay away from? Well, I have a lot to say about that. I won't go into it all right now. But actually, when you go to the com, I believe there is a link to a post where I sort of start talking about that. But... The one thing I would I would look out for is let's go back to here. I would definitely do drafts in the cloud because it's not fully it, it won't look the same as native Revit. So I would definitely do drafts to see how things things are, are used. Um, the big things are reflections. Um, if you use this bump bump glass technique, you'll see that uh, it looks a little different in the cloud than it does here. Reflections sometimes get treated a little differently. Um, the biggest my biggest pet peeve is the uh, self illuminating objects and the light fixtures. Um, so one of the big things, and again, these, these, will, these are on the blog. Um, I can try and quickly pull it up, um, is that when you're using uh, artificial lights or self-illuminated uh, light, light materials, uh, the cloud is very inconsistent. And so if I pull up a, a post here, I'll quickly see if I can get to it. Is actually pretty recent. So one thing it does is with artificial lighting, the cloud for some reason shows the uh, light source. <clears throat> and then self-illuminating, if I pull this picture up, you can see here, this is native, and it looks pretty uniform. If I go to the next one, this is the cloud, and you can see it's going all like, like craziness. I, I don't know what it's doing. So that, that's one thing to look out for the cloud, you know, self-illuminating. And the other one, is with the light fixtures, which actually show show the light fixture. So here we go. <clears throat> that would be Revit native. If I zoom in, you can see it's a nice soft light. You don't see the, the source. If I click here, this is Revit Cloud. You can see these weird planes that show up. Those are things that I would highly suggest looking out for. Um, and so Michael asked uh, if you can briefly explain what an asset is. Is it just the image file? No. Um, assets are <clears throat> a little difficult to explain, but um, let's see. So if I pull up my material browser, the way I, I understand them is this is my material. So over on the left-hand side is my actual material. But then within the material, you have assets. And the assets could be physical, rendering, which is appearance, and thermal. So if I hit, hit it here, I could do physical. It's another one. So now you've got a material, and within the material, you've got these types that you can add to it. So the appearance one is the one we're dealing with. And <clears throat> it's really powerful because you can, you, can, you can add all this information to it, but it, it can be 
a little detrimental because if you don't duplicate it, you can apply an asset to two different materials. And let's see. So if I duplicate this glass, for instance, glass number two, and I want to change this. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to change the color. But I didn't duplicate it, so I'll change this to green. See how this is green? Well, notice it affected the other, the other material because they're both using the same asset. So I guess it's, it's just a subset of a material or a type if you want to think about it that way. I uh, hope that helped a little. I, I've, I've been wanting to have a more detailed explanation of assets, and it's not even really uh, detailed very well in the wiki, so maybe, maybe that deserves a post. Um, so Angelo asks, when you import from a custom library, does it copy the maps locally and where to? The library only imports the assets. It doesn't import the images. So you're going to have to bring your materials folder to the local or on the server and point to it. And then the library knows that it's looking for you know, glassbump.jpg. Um, so the, the, you need to bring over that library file, which is the ADSKL, what is it, let's see, uh, ADSKLIB. And you need to bring over your materials and have Revit point to both. So no, it doesn't bring, the, the LIB does not bring the JPEGs. Ooh, these questions are flying in now. Let's see here. Um, import from custom libraries and copy modes. Uh. Um, Anna asked for uh, Ashlar Masonry Stone. Um, <clears throat> Anna, if you want to email me outside of this, I guess, I don't, I'm not going to look for different types of materials, but you've you got to really look around for what materials there are. Um, but I would say if you want to, a part of a question was, uh, is there a specific stone she's looking for? And then can you change the color uh, for rendering? I would suggest changing the image color in Photoshop before you render and make it a new material. So for instance, if I want to make this block, I'm just going to copy and paste it. I'm going to open it in Photoshop. So I open it in Photoshop. And then in here, I'm going to change the hue. Let's say we want it for some reason to be green. And then I'm going to click OK and save that. And now I'm going to use this as my image. Using tints, I would not suggest in Revit, uh, especially if you can use the cloud. Tinting does not work in the cloud very well. Um, is there a way to send the material library to someone else, such as us? Uh, Bishop asked if there was a way to send the material library to someone else. And you can send the Autodesk library file and your material folder to anyone. And as long as they point to that folder and load that library, everything will work. So yes, you can. Um, Nicholas asked, hey, Nick, what's going on, man? Sorry, Nick, Nick's a friend, so it's a Connecticut or New York, Connecticut area. Um, I was wondering if there's a way to not only move the assets for materials, but for other projects as well. I noticed it is very tedious to move things like wall tags, elevation markers, etc. Um, so it looks like it's you, you're talking about sort of transferring project standards, uh, uh, but for other projects as well. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm not sure if the asset library is the same as moving tags and project standards. Actually, let's let's see if why not do this on the fly here. So if I look around area volume, let's see. So you can transfer materials through through the transfer project materials or uh, transfer project standards which you can see here, I'll, I'll check it off. So I'm wondering if the assets come along with it. I'm not sure, we'll have to test that later, but you can transfer materials, so who knows? Give it, give it a try. <clears throat> uh, similar move. Uh, he also asked if it's similar for other items. Uh, there's, there's, does, it depends on what you're moving, but that's, that's about it. Uh, Matteo asked, what was the other texture web li library besides CG Textures and Google? So the other one was GoboTree. Let me open that up. And I rarely use this one for textures. I actually use it more for cutouts. But if you go through it, there's a texture, uh, there's a texture filter, and sometimes there's some good things. You can see here I got a brick, and this is actually also free. I think you have to create a login, but it's it's a free site. Uh, the problem is they don't have a lot of seamless textures. They just have textures, so you got to sort of see if they're seamless or see if they do your job. So that's gobotree.com. I'll leave that up for right now. Um, all right, so we got 10 minutes. I'm trying to fly through these. You guys have no idea how many questions are on my screen right now. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, uh, what was the other texture? Can you make your own textures from pictures of walls? John asks. So John, that's a great question. And yes, you can, and the process would be exactly the same. The biggest thing with, with creating your own textures is the seamless part of it. 
And what I mean by that is making it so that when it repeats, um, you 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 don't see a, a, a repetition line. So let's let's grab one of these ones that I know won't work very well. So if I click this one, oh, I'm not logged in, am I? Okay, so let's let's go to CG textures. I'll just download one that I know is not seamless. So I'll download this guy. Of course, it is seamless. That's all right. <clears throat> So if I if I open this in Photoshop real quick, oh I guess I saved it downloads. Okay, so when this repeats, I'll do it. Actually, uh, maybe I'll just show you this real quick. So what I do to check if something's seamless before bringing it in Revit is I just put a quick filter in Photoshop. If you go to Filter, Other, and Offset. It allows you to shift the, the pattern from the left to right and up and down. So you can see this one's seamless. It doesn't, you know, it, it's, it, you can't see the edges. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make it not seamless, just so that you can get a sense of it. I'm going to draw a black line here, and I don't know, something like that. Okay? Now if I go to Filter, Other, Offset, and I move it, notice how there's this seam right here? And if I do it the other way, move it, there's a seam right there. So that's what you're going to see when it repeats in Revit. So you can take a picture and make it make it your own, but you gotta tweak it and sort of crop it in, in Photoshop to make it seamless. It's not easy, I can promise you. Uh, Rocky, Rocky asked, "Is there a way to quickly import materials from your customized library into a new file?" Um, I think I answered that. Uh, he's showing you the you know bring it through or or through the other way. So we'll just move on. Uh, Michael asked, "When you." say material asset are you referring to the image file I think I explained that a little too if you missed it just uh, go back to the recording uh, Mia or Mila Ooh, Mila what is the best method to export models from Revit from to Rhino I don't know um, and I think it's a little outside of this so we'll move on to that one Michael asked have I used arrowway textures for textures um, I have not I, I guess we can pull it up real quick if, if if no one saw that question, so he asked about arrowwaytextures.com. Hope I typed it right. So it looks like there's uh, some textures here that you can buy. So there's another website for you guys to check out. I haven't used it, but I'm sure it's good. <clears throat> uh, Celeste asked about the glow technique. So I guess we can get into that. We've got still got eight minutes, right? So the glow technique. If you notice in this rendering, I'll pull it up. In this rendering, if I zoom in here, you can see all these little fins, and they're glowing. And that's what I'm talking about, the glow technique. And so what that is, is um, it exists in most rendering programs. It's called a self-illuminating object, and Revit does have a self-illuminating object. And so I'll just I'll make this wall glow. Why not? Let's go to Manage Materials. I'm going to CMU. CMU wall webinar. So I'm going to replace this asset. And what you want to search for, again, is using a typical, a typical Revit uh, <clears throat> built-in material is what I usually use is light on. So if you type the word light and on, and then you go on your glass, there's something called light bulb on, and you replace it. And that's a good one to start with. <clears throat> so if I go down here, you can see it's actually a glowing light bulb. And then what you can do is you start tweaking it and make it different colors. So if I want it to be blue, for instance, I'll go blue. And then if I scroll down to, there's a little checkbox here called self-illumination. Simply change that to blue as well. It's updating. Now you can see it made it purple because of the luminance and the color temperature. But now you see where it is. That's the sort of uh, location of it. You can crank up the luminance and you can make it brighter, made it lighter. And I use that quite a bit. So uh, take a look at that and have some fun. I'll click OK so it actually goes. Whoop, there we go. Look at that. Cool. <clears throat> um, Mark asked, what is the best way to set up a JPEG to get a material to tile correctly? Um, I guess I sort of showed that with the offsets. Honestly, it's, it's, it's quite a process so I would uh, if you Google it there's probably some techniques on making seamless textures 
John asked, uh, the top edge doesn't seem to, it doesn't line up. Uh, John asked, if, if something doesn't line up correctly with the blocks, do you adjust it? Yes, I do. So what I'll do is, if, if it's a custom material that's going towards a certain area, <clears throat> I will go in and I will change the block. So actually, let's undo that material thing so we can go back. So let's do... hide this. So if you want to adjust the block to make it look right in the uh, in the rendering, if I have time I'll usually do it. Notice here it's splitting the block. You can actually go in, three, in uh, elevation, measure it, and then just do an offset. So if I go, oops, I wrong one. So if I go to my material, I go to appearance, and then I hit my block, there's an offset here, x and y direction. So if you know it's got to go down by three inches, click apply. And honestly, it's 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 very much and you can see it's, it's actually off from the bump map now, but it's very much trial and error in Revit, unfortunately. One of the nice things about 3D Max is you can do it in three dimensions and just sort of s s push and pull it to make it line up. Um, but I do, I do try and make it right. Um, let's see, Rocky asked... Uh, nope, that's not... Rocky asked about uh, managing materials between different projects again, so I think I answered most of that. Um, Nancy asked about repeating the material download URLs. Um, so again, that's gobotree.com. That is uh, cgtextures.com. And I guess Arrowway Textures is one to look at too. <clears throat> um, Jonathan asked if I had problems with the cloud while rendering a white edge around the building. Yes, I've had plenty of problems with the cloud. Uh, um, they fix some of them, they don't fix all of them, but you can't beat the amount of time you save by using it. So I'm just sort of working with it and trying to make it work. And hopefully uh, it ends up being uh, updated in the future. Um, do you, how do you do mesh hey, Jeffrey. materials? Yep. Hey, Jeffrey, I have an idea. Yep. How about you, uh, you answer one more question and then <laughs> tell me if this is crazy. We yeah. always send you all the questions and then we'll write a blog post where, if you don't mind, you can answer all these questions extensively and... Um, Perfect. And everybody, because we're, believe it or not, only halfway to all the questions yeah, we there, received. Huh? Yeah. So I think it would make a fantastic blog post and everybody can get detailed information and images and you can even put the pictures of all the dogs roaming your apartments. That would be Great. fantastic. <laughs> okay. Okay, pick, pick another question and then we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Okay, let me, let me find a good one then. I'm trying to find a good one. There's a few repeated ones. Oh, here we go. Here's a good one. I don't know if I have time to show it. But, um, <clears throat> so they asked about if, if I have a technique for creating a, a white model rendering. And what I've actually done, I think I might, I might be able to do this in time. Let's see. If if you set up phases in your project, you can actually make a phase before everything that is white, or after everything that is completely white. So, if I go to phases, manage phases, I create one more after and say white model. And then for existing, you make sure that the material is a white material. So, appearance, we just do white. Um, you could change the gray at halftone, but that's one of the easiest ways without affecting your model. So I think I showed that pretty quickly, and Barbara, I think that's going to be it then. Thank you so much. I think you achieved the impossible. You, you were as accurate as you could be. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to uh, take back the screen, and okay. let me know if you see my screen now. Yes, I do. Oh, great. Fantastic. I yes, apologize for the for the dog barking too. If you hear that, no, that neighbor. that was that was a great you know that's uh, improvisation. That's great. So um, I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar, and I want to thank you uh, thank you so much, Jeffrey, 
uh, for an outstanding demonstration. You are Thanks the unfa you are the enfant prodige of uh, of <laughs> the beam <laughs> scene. Absolutely. I want to remind everybody to also visit our web page at noveg.com and check out Revit 2015. Noveg is the best way to buy design software online, bar none. And for information on the latest special and new releases on our huge array of design software, join the Noveg network and like us on Facebook, Google Plus or Twitter. And um, stay tuned for this uh, blog post that uh, Jeffrey is going to write with us where he will definitely answer all the questions that he was asked today. And thank you so much, Jeffrey, for uh, agreeing to do that. Uh, oh, thanks for having me. Yes. In our, um, in our next uh, webinar will be early design and a big BIM workflow with back to work. So design workflow that incorporates BIM practices quickly leads to more efficient and dependable solutions. And to rewatch today's webinar, uh, or previous webinars, check out the Noveg Vimeo or YouTube channel and there's a lot to choose from our playlists, uh, even today's webinar. So stay tuned, our link will be out as early as tomorrow on our social media and uh, we'll upload the webinar today as soon as, soon as we're done. Uh, thanks, thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day and thank you Jeffrey for um, an outstanding presentation and uh, for the, the work ahead of you on our, on our blog. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again and goodbye.